Good afternoon. This is Discussions with Authors, part of Books Over Drinks, an online community meant to foster the passion for books by providing a platform for both authors and readers to exchange ideas and discuss their work. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Henry Jeffries to discuss his book, Empire of Booths, British History Through the Bottom of the Glass. Uh, Henry is a renowned uh, drinks uh, correspondent and features editor at the Master of, uh, Mo of the Master of Malt blog. He worked in the wine trade and publishing before becoming a freelance writer and broadcaster. His work has appeared in The Expectators, The, Gar the Expectator, The Guardian, the BBC Radio, and the um, Oldie and Food Wine Magazine. This book is fantastic. Um, it looks at the source of modern drinks starting from the 17th century, presenting a case for British influence and its contributions to virtually every major alcoholic drink we come to, we've come to love. Now, booze is deeply ingrained in our society and a common part of our social conventions, uh, but its history is more complicated and richer than you think. Uh, it is also about the byproduct of human ingenuity and imperial influence, of course. People say history gets to be written by the victors, but booze is a perfect case study on how a region in the small corner of Europe capitalized and influenced modern preferences one sip at a time. Each of the chapters covers background stories uh, of merchants, scientists, stealers, and entrepreneurs that brought some of these drinks to life, and some of the much darker and ignominious facts behind drinks like rum and its relationship to slavery, for example. If you're someone with an untrained palate, like me, or your, or your connoisseurship uh, is limited to mainstream brands, you'll likely find yourself Googling Marsala, Porto, Madeira, and many other vintage drinks you have likely never heard of. Uh, some of which are still commercially available, carrying with it a taste of history and the genetic lineage of the very same materials used to produce these hundreds of years ago. And there lies the beauty of this book. It is a master class on the history of British colonialism through the lens of alcohol. But beyond that, its narrative is not just limited to places, people, and historical facts, but a vivid description giving readers a taste of the rich, colorful, and sophisticated flavors that made some of these drinks legendary. This is definitely a book you'll love. Henry, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're happy to have you with us. Oh, well, great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So Henry, you have been writing about booze for uh, more than a decade, but what motivated you to write the book specifically centered around the influence of the British Empire on alcohol worldwide? Well, it, it, the, the, I had the idea for the book a long time ago. It was about when I was working in a wine shop and I, look at all the names on the bottle. So you'd have Taylor's Port, you'd have Harvey's Bristol Cream, you know, on something that was Portuguese or Spanish, or you looked at the names of Bordeaux Chateau, like Palmer, Brown, and, and, and you think, there's a story here. Why have they all got British names? So that was the germ of the idea. And that must have been 20 years ago I had that idea. And then it, I got made got me redundant from my job in publishing and I thought you know what I'm going to try and write this book but it took an awful long time to find a publisher write the book but eventually in 2016 it came out so it was a very very long process let's talk, about, very interesting. Yeah. Let's talk about wine which I gotta be honest I thought I knew a bit that that is until I read your book uh, you refer to how much of the, uh, how for much of the uh, 17th century, British expansion put it at odds with its neighbors and how navigation acts designed to trade, uh, to take trade away from enemies, triggered scarcity and drove up the price of imported wines, thus forcing the British to seek substitute products like cider or porto, which you're covering your book. Now, people say port, uh, port, I'm sorry, port, uh, port is uh, much as a British creation as a Portuguese one. Can you tell us about, about the history of uh, port and how it became to be a staple in uh, British drinking? Yes, yeah, well, it's a, it's a very long story, but it, it goes back a long way. The, the, the British and the Portuguese have been allies for 800 years, and it's mainly to do with the fact that both of us were threatened by Spain. So the Portuguese, obviously, tiny little part on the Iberian Peninsula, so they're always going to have trouble with Spain. And Spain was the dominant power in the 16th and some of the 17th century and we were a power on the rise so we we both shared a common enemy and when Britain or England as it was then was 
struggling to, well, was it at war with France? Was it at war with Holland? These are the people that the Dutch brought in wine from France. We needed a, a source for wine that wasn't supplied by one of our enemies. So the place we went to was our oldest friends, the Portuguese. Um, so, you know, that, that, that was the idea. So rather than drinking wine from Bordeaux, we would drink wine from Portugal. But the problem with the wine from Portugal is to begin with, people didn't like it very much. You know, it, 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 it often wasn't very good. It would have been transported in goat skins. It would have been a bit kind of, the, the French had been making export quality wine for a long time. So they were good at it. It, it arrived in, in good condition. The Portuguese stuff didn't arrive in good condition. So people added alcohol to it to make it travel better. So the idea was that if it's stronger, it's going to last the sea voyage better to England. So early port would have been a kind of dry, strong, red Portuguese wine with brandy poured in it and then sent to England. And the idea was that the brandy would make it last. So that's where you have the kind of early days of port, which would have been sort of mid 17th century. Interesting. And around that time, like you were referring to English merchants in Portugal having sort of like diplomatic advantages, allowing them to stand above Portugal uh, law. How did they come to achieve such positions? Yes, well, the, yeah, I mean, that's the thing about the, the relationship between the Portuguese and the English is it was at times not, not a particularly equal one. So the sort of English merchants, and they weren't just English, they were Irish, Scottish, and, and from all over the place. There were, there were Danish ones and Dutch ones and Norwegian ones. Um, because the English were powerful and rich, they formed their own community in Porto. And they were rather like a diplomatic corps, so rather like diplomats had diplomatic immunity. The British, mer the English merchants in particular, had a kind of diplomatic immunity. So they said they wouldn't be tried by Portuguese courts, they wouldn't be subject to Portuguese law, um, and they formed this kind of separate, it's almost like a sort of merchant aristocracy, which lasts, which still exists to this day, which is the amazing thing. You go to Porto. And there are still descendants of these merchants, Sandermans, um, Simmingtons, these great families. They're still there, though they, 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 they have intermarried with the Portuguese and they all speak fluent Portuguese and fluent English. But if you met them, you would never say they're anything but English gentlemen, even though they've spent their whole lives in Portugal. So it's, it's very interesting the way those communities have persisted in certain places. So in the book, you mention about uh, Porto and cider, among others, as uh, drinking it as a patriotic duty, making a political statement. And this is because of the wars uh, with France that occurred over the centuries. In general terms, what uh, relationship do you think Bush has with uh, politics and foreign affairs? Well, um, you know, do you know what? I would like it if it didn't have any relationship at all with, with, with politics and foreign affairs and you just drank what you enjoyed. But in the past, it had huge, huge importance. First of all, it was, I mean, the, the book is really about the impact of politics on drink. So the politics is equally important and it's about how someone will be at war with someone, someone will raise taxes on something, there'll be a treaty with someone. And then inadvertently, that leads to the creation of certain drinks. So the development of port because of war with France, or back in England, um, the development of high strength ciders as a replacement for French wine. And the interesting thing was that it became it became a kind of statement of your politics, even back in England, what you drank. So if you were a supporter of the, um, I don't know how much you know about English history, I mean, there's a, there's a, it, it gets a bit complicated, but basically if you were a supporter of King James, you were called a Jacobite and you would have been pro, pro this is very loosely based, but you would have been pro-Catholic and pro-French. 
So you would have drunk Bordeaux, especially in Scotland. So supporters of the Jacobites in Scotland would have drunk claret to show that they were supporting the Jacobites. Whereas if you supported the Hanoverians, who were at war with France, Protestant, you would drink port to show that you were anti-French and um, anti-Jacobite. So it was a sort of, so you, so, and, and this persisted for years. So if you read the novels of Patrick O'Brien, which are, do you know the film Master and Commander? It's, mm -hmm. um, it, it's that era and people are judged on what they drink. So if someone has got some claret in, it's a sign that he's a Jacobite, a, a pro um, King James sort of element. So it, it, it's, it was, and, and, I th and I think it persisted right up until, up until in some Scottish regiments, they would lift a glass and then they would put it over their glass of water as a toast to the king over the water. So the Jacobite pretender, who, you know, there hadn't been a Jacobite king for 300 years, but the Scots, there were Scottish regiments, Highland regiments, who were still make, making a political point with their, you know, and it was a slightly ritual, you know, they weren't actually plotting to overthrow the government or anything, but they were showing a kind of um, old historic allegiance to a king, a dead king. So it, you know, it, it persisted for a long time. Yeah, and I found it very interesting also in, uh, from what we read in your book in the US after the War of Independence, that some drinks that were very popular among the British suddenly became very unpopular with the American patriots because they associated with the, all the colonial uh, rule. Yes, because well, rum was the drink of colonial America rum. rather than whiskey. And then whiskey became the patriotic um, drink for Americans. But that's also a lot to do with um, rum is a sort of coastal drink. So it's, you know, the, 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 the molasses came from the, um, the Caribbean and it went up to kind of New England and stuff and was distilled on the coast. So boats would come up. Whereas whiskey was an inland drink and it was produced by people moving west. So as they went west, they would plant corn or, or maize, as we call it in England. And that would be used by, they were mainly kind of um, Scots and Irish to make a version of whiskey, but made with maize. So they were away from the coast where the rum was made and they made, then whiskey became the drink of patriotic Americans, whereas rum was the drink of colonialists. Yeah, very, very interesting if you look how actually it shapes uh, history and today's drinking habits. Uh, yeah. So we see in the book uh, many different uh, technical aspects of the production of wine, beer, rum and other liquors from the ripening of the grapes to fermentation, oxidation, fortification through adding uh, brandy, all of which are aimed to produce the drinks that we currently love. Can you tell us from those techniques, which ones have sustained the passage of time, which ones may be similar to what was done 300, 400 years ago, perhaps? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I think the, the probably the, the drink that has persisted the most, though it has changed quite a bit, is red Bordeaux, so claret. So what we think of as, um, you know, the kind of archetypal red wine was developed oh i mean but bordeaux used to be quite a cheap wine it was designed to be drunk pretty quickly after it was made but in the 17th century this chap called armand de pontac created the model for a wine that would last and he sold it in london it was called aubryon and you can still buy aubryon and it was like three times the price of normal wine and it was designed to last so it would you could keep it in a barrel or in bottle and it would improve with age and he concentrated on certain grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon I and mean, we, we can't be exactly sure what he was planting but he chose some grapes over other ones and he created the model for red Bordeaux which took off in the 18th and 19th century you had you know Latour, Margot, Lafitte all, all those famous names have their roots in the 18th century. And this wine, which the English called claret, became the model 
for red wine all over the world. So they planted Cabernet Sauvignon in Chile and tried to make Chile and claret, you know, very, very successfully. The same in California, um, the same in, in Spain with Rioja. They, they planted Cabernet, but then they started using the local grapes. But the model of making a high quality red wine aged in oak that could last for 10, 20, 30, you know, 50 years in bottle was invented in the 17th century. And, you know, we, we obviously we can't try 17th century claret but it's probably not that different to modern Bordeaux. So I would say that that's the one that hasn't, probably hasn't changed that much. And uh, by the way, do you know why the British call it the claret? It's because originally it was a pale red wine called claret, meaning clear. And, and then, they, so they started calling all red wine from Bordeaux claret or claret, and then Claret changed to be a very deep coloured wine that wasn't Claret at all. And in fact, Claret is still sold in Bordeaux, but it's almost like a rosé rather than it's mm -hmm. like between a rosé and a red wine. So it's a sort of archaic name that has persisted. I see. Now let's talk about the mythos behind some of these familiar names like Don Perignon and Captain Morgan that although have been embellished uh, for marketing purposes do carry with it some stories of the past. Even reading about some of the consequential inventions like the invention of the wine bottle uh, stand on the shoulders of men with colorful, as you, I think you refer to as colorful past to say the least. Uh, yeah. Men like uh, Sir Kellen uh, Digby. Um, who are these characters? Um, yeah, well, I, mean, the, the, that, I suppose the, the thing about those kind of days were you didn't really have professionals. You didn't have someone whose only job was science or being a merchant. So people did all kinds of things. So Kenan Digby was a sort of early scientist, but he was also a pirate. Well, kind of a privateer, which was a licensed pirate. So you were paid by, by the crown to go and steal some Spanish ships or something like that. He was a soldier. Um, and he was also a, um, a sort of magician. He tried to turn, he tried to do alchemy. He tried to do lead into, in, into gold. So, so people were just, I don't know, I think people were just kind of more colorful in those days because they didn't, they didn't specialize. So someone wouldn't just, wouldn't, so the story isn't just about this person went into the drinks trade at 17 and worked his whole life in drinks. They had a huge, they had a huge hinterland which makes them, you know, he was, Digby was accused of murdering his wife. Um, he wrote books, he wrote novels. Um, he probably had an affair with the King of France's mother. You know, he, he, did, all, he did all this stuff. So yeah, they were just, you know, they, they built people differently in those days, I think. And, and what's interesting about it is that all of these names and concepts that were just, that have become just part of or in, ingrained in our everyday lives and they're just, or that we just trivialize in a way, they do have a backstory. I mean, even stuff that you refer to as Navy strength, which is just a label that we may see there, um, there is a story behind it on how it would, how they would measure the alcohol content, uh, which I think you described at length as to whether they, they would try to, um, light it up or or yeah they would they would mix it with gunpowder um the the rum and if it didn't light then it was too it was too weak and they would say this this is too weak you know you're trying to sell me bad quality rum and if it lit then it was called called proof or navy strength which works out at in modern terms at about 57 percent alcohol by volume and if it exploded it meant on them probably you know probably too strong but they didn't really mind because they were going <laughs> to dilute it anyway so th there was no other way of measuring alcohol apart from that now in chapter in chapter seven um really curious you describe the taste of an 1875 malvasia um you tried at the berry brothers wine merchant a few years back and you covered um as you as you were covering some of the wines that seem to age well um, how would you describe for layman uh, the difference between an 1871 Ravasha and uh, wine and a much more contemporary one who may just get somewhere? Yeah, well, I mean, you can't really compare anything to Madeira because Madeira, which is from a Portuguese island off the coast of West Africa, tastes like nothing else on earth. It doesn't taste like, if you think about what 
wine tastes like, people think of, you know, a Malbec or a Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon Blanc. You know, they're they're fruity, they're dry, they're light, you know, lightish. Um, Madeira doesn't taste like that. Madeira has huge acidity. It tastes of kind of sort of marmalade and oak and just all kinds of things. And the Malvasia, which is the sweetest kind, is very, very sweet as well. So it tastes almost like a sort of, almost like a sort of pudding, but with this incredibly intense acidity. And then it's just, there's, there's, there's no comparison. And I suppose it, it's, you know, you were asking me about how wine has changed. Bordeaux was made to be, to age without oxygen. So it was to emphasize those kind of fruit flavors. Whereas traditionally wine that was aged would have oxidized. So the oxygen would have got to it. So you get totally different flavors. You get, if you think about what sherry tastes like or what masala tastes like, it's those kind of oxidative flavors like orange peel, nuts, brown sugar, that sort of stuff. That's what you get in oxidized wine. And that's not what people want these days. So it's it's a taste of how wine used to be. You made me crave Madeira now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love them. I, they're not very fashionable, but when you ha if you get the taste for oxidized wines like tawny port, um, sherry, dry masala, very hard to get hold of. But you try it, and it's just it's addictive. That kind of nuttiness and that um, the tang of acidity. And that almost like hint of vinegar you get in them. They're just, it's nothing else like them. Amazing. I will definitely order one later tonight. Oh. There's a, you can get some very nice ones um, from Greece. You get traditional Vinsanto from mm. Santorini. Yes. And they are, they, and they'll often be a bit oxidized. Um, and they're just wonderful because you have incredible sweetness, but massive acidity as well. And they last forever. You know, if you, if you get a good Vinsanto, it'll probably net, it'll probably last longer than you. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Vinsanto, and I have to say in your book you don't mention a lot about uh, Greek wines. Only no, no, I, I do, do you know I didn't talk about Greek wines or Levantine wines. Not that they weren't popular, but I feel like the British taste didn't change them. So they sometimes would arrive via Venetian, so Cypriot wines wines from Asia Minor, North Africa, you know, those kind of places. But they weren't developed for or affected by British tastes. They were just made as they had been made probably for thousands of years. And then they would turn up in London via merchants and they would be appreciated. But there wasn't that, you know, you didn't have British merchants going to Cyprus. Well, I suppose you did a bit, you know, because there's Commanderia, which is the yeah, maybe I should have brought in Cyprus a bit more if I'd had space. Maybe in a second one. Yeah, yeah, well, do you know, I wanted to do a second one, actually, um, but I haven't got round to it. I was waiting for some publisher to offer me a huge amount of money to, 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 to write a sequel, but it never happened. Uh, so in uh, chapter six, you cover the devil's drink, rum, which yeah. is a byproduct of the Caribbean sugar industry. What most people don't realize is the relationship uh, rum used to have with slavery in terms of labor and the disgusting practices that came to be referred as the seasoning process during which the wick would die. So what could you tell us more about the rum's uh, dark past? Well, I mean, it's all, it's all pretty dark. It was a drink that was made because made possible because of slavery. So it was, you know, the sugar plantations were worked by, by slaves in the Caribbean, in Brazil, in all these kind of places. And the Europeans brought their distillation skills to deal with the native, it wasn't native actually, you know, sugar cane comes from Arabia or India, I think, but, it, but they planted it and then they had it and be and as they knew distillation they started making drinks out of it and they would feed or feeds not quite 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 the right word but they would give this very rough form of rum to the slaves and then there was this thing you allude to the seasoning process so you'd have these poor people who would have been 
shipped over from West Africa. And then they were, to get them used to the climate and stuff, they were given rum and they were, um, and then the weak ones just died. <laughs> it was just barbaric. Um, and so, so rum was drunk by, was given to the slaves, but also rum was, better quality rum was made by the, by the masters, by the, by the Europeans. Um, so you'd have, um, in, I think in Barbados is considered like the home of better quality rums, but they tended to exist more on the British islands because on the Spanish islands, the Spanish wanted the European masters to buy Spanish produce. So they didn't want them to develop rum into a quality drink. They wanted them to buy brandy and sherry and stuff like that from Spain. So the rum industry took a lot longer to develop in Cuba, Colombia, places like that, the quality rum industry. Whereas in Jamaica and Barbados, they were making high quality rum, not just to drink on the island, but to export to, to back to England or send to, 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 to America. Um, so you have these kind of very different histories of how the rum industry developed in these places. No, but it's it, it's such a sort of unpleasant story. So it's one that you, um, you know, obviously the rum producers nowadays they don't want to make a big thing about, you know, the 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 past of their drinks. Like Captain Morgan, it's a brand of rum, but he was also a slaver, you know, and and he wasn't and a pirate, and he, you know, he was a very very unpleasant person. Um, so it's sort of you know I, I feel like at some point with Captain Morgan, people are going to be like. Hang on, you know why are we why are we drinking this rum that's named after this appalling person? Um, so it's um, yeah, it's, it's it's one that people don't talk about very much, and, and perhaps perhaps they should. But at the same time, I mean, the rum industry is now a sort of multinational industry. It's not run by descendants of the slavers anymore. So, for example, Appleton Estate is owned by Campari. Who are an Italian company, um, so perhaps they don't feel that guilt or responsibility that maybe they should. I don't know. It's it's a it's a very uh, complicated one. Yeah, it's a delicate uh, subject. Yeah. And in a moment of joy, you cheers to a slaver with a cup and morning. Yeah, and also if you you know if you talk to people from Barbados, they are very proud of their rum. You know, even though the rum has a very dark history they are they want people to drink Barbados rum and they want people to celebrate Barbados rum the same with Jamaica you know they're very proud of the, this drink that has a horrible history you know is something wonderful that their country produces so you kind of you don't want to put people off rum completely because it's what supports a lot of the Caribbean economy so it's sort of it's a kind of you know you don't want to say don't drink rum because of slavery because it helps the Caribbean, it helps the descendants of slaves. So it's, you know, it, it, it's a, I'm glad I'm not in doing marketing for a rum company because it would be difficult. Now let's, let's, uh, let's switch to one of my favorite topics, beer. And I gotta oh, yeah. say, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a lager type of guy, uh, which is what I've done a world, a worldwide uh, favorite. Um, however, over the past years, um, in, and in your book you cover it quite well, that we've seen a revolution of the, the revolution of craft beer and uh, it's spearheaded by micro beer, brewers. Um, you seem to attribute it to a form of protest against the, bl the, the planets of uh, common style laggers in the market, uh, starting in the U.S. and then proliferating, uh, prolif um, spreading across the world. Um, what is the future of craft of craft uh, beers? Oh God, that's a tricky one. I don't really, I don't really know. I sort of. I sometimes think that at some point everyone is going to start drinking craft beer. But then if you look at the best selling beers in the world, it's still Heineken, Budweiser, that kind of stuff. So though their market, though their sales are, de are declining. So the sort of even though craft craft is tiny, but growing and everything else is huge, but contracting. But I think kind of craft like beer, you know, let's say craft, it's a very hard thing to define, but let's just say it's beer with lots of flavor. 
I think is always going to be quite a small thing because people love something that's cold, refreshing. You know, they love their Corona and their Sol and their Heineken and things like that. So I think craft will, you know, I think it'll always be quite small. I think that by definition, it needs to meet that standard, right? I mean, uh, in terms of like what to be considered one. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just I'm I'm kind of generalizing hugely about what what craft means because there's so many craft breweries that are now owned by Heineken or Budweiser, or and then it's like, are they still craft? And then in England, we have a lot of sort of mid-sized breweries, which are you know they're not microbreweries and they're not Budweiser. They're small but quite big at the same time. Are they craft? So it's sort of you know it's a it's a hard one, and and, and I'm not really an expert on modern beer you know i like drinking beer i'm interested in the history of it but the actual where the beer market is going is not my not my area of expertise so we we mentioned a bit in passing uh, publishing the book so the book was published using uh, unbound.com which is a crowdfunding website uh, we took a look it's very interesting what was your experience bringing this book to life um it was you know it was hard because i i had an agent at one point and he was very keen on the book and he thought that we would get a proper not a proper publisher but you know a, a traditional publisher to publish the book in about 2010 2011 and it never really happened when it didn't i mean it didn't happen at all um which was very disappointing um, so I just sort of sat on it for a bit and then I approached Unbound and we did it with them. And it was, you know, it was OK. They were a good company in some ways and a not so good company in other ways. Um, but it was just I was just very pleased to actually get around to writing the book. I was very pleased just to write it, which I never thought I'd be able to do, actually finish a book and then to see it in print and see people responding to it has been has been incredible and you know just you getting in touch five years after it was published to say that you enjoyed it is wonderful it's a it's a book that i mean it wasn't a massive success it sold a few thousand copies but i still get emails from people you know i still get invited to do things so it's one that it clearly struck a chord with people yeah we're well, certainly pleased that uh, it got published in the end as well no. because we really enjoyed it Good. So uh, we're approaching towards the end, and uh, before we close, we like to ask our guests what is their drink of preference and perhaps what kind of drink goes well with their book. Uh, it's a tough one with your book since it's about uh, booze, so I guess it's going to be hard to pick one, but uh, which one would you choose? I would choose a dry sherry, so a manthania or a fino sherry like Tio Pepe, something like that. That's my probably my favorite drink. It goes with any food, any book, and it's what I'm probably going to have in a minute. I just, you know, it's my. I always have. I always have a bottle in the fridge, and um, so yeah, a, a, a chilled glass of Manfinia, best drink in the world. Perfect. I have to say, I drank maybe four different drinks while reading the book because whenever it's up there, I was like, oh, I crave this now. Oh, I crave this now. You say yourself in the book, it's, you can you can take it as sort of like a, a drinking game in a way, uh, drinking your way through uh, every chapter. Um, it, it's it's definitely it was definitely our experience. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. We we, we certainly did. Um, all right. The book is called Empire of Booze: um, British uh, History Through the Bottom of the Glass. Um, it is by Henry Jeffries. Uh, we'll share the link to his bio and the book for you to learn more about him and his work. Henry, it was a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to having you back. It was wonderful to be on. Thank you so much.